Welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you guys doing? This is uh, Dr. John with Extract Talk. We're happy that you're here. We're joined here with Stefan. Stefan. Yes, just me. <laughs> and me too. Yeah. I'm, we're all here. We're going to be talking about some cool stuff today. We're going to be talking about extracts, all about extracts, all the different kinds of extracts. People like to know what they are. Really, there's been a huge explosion of different types of extracts, and that really goes back to how they're made. Yep. Really? So... We're going to be talking about really what those are. But before we get started, we'd ask that you would take and uh, hit that subscribe button, pound it. We'd like you guys to subscribe and uh, also turn on the notifications uh, so that you guys can get notified when we put out new yeah. content. Stay connected. Yeah. Catch that new drop. Absolutely. So, so let's kind of uh, get into this. Let's talk about what cannabis extracts are right at the very beginning. We'll keep it really basic. Sounds good. I mean... That's what we do, right? Yeah. We extract it. Yeah. Um, that should be an easy, really easy question for really, us to answer. Really easy. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of variables to consider depending yeah. on how you're extracting. Right. But ultimately, it's just concentrating the target molecules within the plant. Right. 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 Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're, we're converting say a, a one solid dosage form into another solid dosage form where yeah, right. we're, we're concentrating them. Right. That's mm -hmm. what, that's what a cannabis extract is. Right. You can do that with a solvent. You can do that with a cryogenic liquid. Yep. Right. CO2, uh -huh. ethanol, pentane, methanol, butane, freon, propane, freon, acetone, freon, ether. Yeah. Yeah. The list goes on. Benzene. There's a good one. Yeah, that's a good I'd one. I'd steer clear of a lot of the, a lot of the stuff I just mentioned, yeah. but it's usable. Yeah, it's usable. You can do it. That's what the old school way of extracting, yes. right? Oh yeah, like so, so much tech. Yeah, so there's there we're going to be really talking about how each of them are kind of made, uh, all the different types of cannabis extracts, how they're made, and maybe what the differences are. So let's start off with uh, the easy one, which is crude oil. Oh, I think that's the most complicated. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's let's do it. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and uh, what you're thinking the crude oil is? I think typically, when I explain what crude is, I, I compare it to oil, right? That comes from the ground, uh, petrochem oil, right? Mm -hmm. It's a crude extract. It's the initial stage mm -hmm. of the extraction refinement process. It is the first medium that you receive after the initial extract, whether it be with solvents, water, or or CO two, right? Right, but it's going to contain you know, a lot of the, uh, the plant matrix within that extract, mm -hmm. right? Minus the, you know, the organic matter or the leafy material. Right. So some of that, like, for example, you got the plant matrix, uh, then you have the, the, the phenols, you have the, you have the flavonoids, you have all the background terpenes. Right. If, yep. if it has the terpenes, then you have concentrated cannabinoid or other product that you're really trying to look at. A right. lot of times you're looking for acids instead of cannabinoids or you're looking to improve things. So yeah, that's what a crude extract is. It has the full list of what the plant is. Now there is selectivity in your extraction method, right? Mm -hmm. So some methods will extract less of the components than others right? or more for that matter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in that sense, there really is a, this idea of what a full spectrum extract is, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really difficult to define that in a scientific way because sure. it's variable with one method you might get for example plenty of waxes the other method you might get very little waxes right. just depending on how you're running the uh you know method mm -hmm. i guess yeah absolutely yeah when i'd say a uh, full spectrum i'm thinking full natural plant matrix right, right. flavonoids terpenes cannabinoids oleoresins fats waxes lipids all that stuff in minus there. the leafy material right Right. And also minus the solvents, hopefully. Right. Hopefully. You know. hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. yeah depending solvents on are always reason. there, but you know, um, that would be the other thing. Typically when you take your crude extract, I guess it, you think technically you'd want to remove the solvent that's used in order Absolutely. to, for it to be like an extract, but it, it could also be considered the, you know, like for example, if you're using a vegetable oil or an olive oil to mm -hmm. do your extraction, right? Uh, sometimes people do that, and you know, really, then it would be almost impossible to separate out the solvent. In this case, would be the olive oil uh, from mm -hmm. the API or right. from the extract itself, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there, there are people that do that. I tend to consider that like a lipid infusion. Yeah, right. well, coming right out of the plant, I guess, right. you know. Yeah, one of the issues, of course, we, we've touched on this in other podcasts, is that those types of crude extracts typically in a GMP setting are really not 
not very viable right. simply from the standpoint of stability. It's required of GMP or pharmaceutical extract that all of the background is characterized and identified and uh, all that background is. And typically there's so much stuff in that background right. and it's degrading all the time. Especially so, if the terpenes are there, right? Yeah, right. So it's not stable, mm -hmm. right? So then that is not really a viable extract um, from that perspective. So um, that's only a GMP side. On the recreational side, we don't care if it's nope. degrading. Game, it can it. be thousands of compounds in there. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people want to have that entourage effect or right. whatever that is, um, you know, and they want to make claims about right. the entourage Yet effect. Yet another hard to quantify statement. Yeah, right? the entourage effect, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? But, you know, that's it. It's a real thing. I mean, you have like light beer versus uh, IPA beer. Right. Okay, IPA beer might put you to sleep, whereas light beer, right. you could probably have a lot of it. So there's some effect there. So now we're going to talk about wax, what that is. Essentially, you have some, uh, you know, you have weed wax, you have wax extract, you have THC wax. There's all these terms that they use right. for waxes. Yeah. So what is wax to you, man? So... Wax was traditionally thought of to be only coming from hydrocarbon extracts, right. Right? whether it be BHO, butane hash oil, or faux propane hash oil. Right. Um, but what we found in, in the work we do is we can make it with CO2 as well. Mm -hmm. CO2 is capable as well. Mm -hmm. And it's basically conducting the extraction to where so you have a large amount of waxes come along with the target molecules, the target cannabinoids, Right. which then once you remove that solvent, it stabilizes mm -hmm. into a very, you know, form fairly hard, malleable product, right? right? So it's, it's stable to the touch. You can bend it, you can pull it, you can snap it. Um, Typically you do that kind of curing, right, right in the vacuum oven, right. for example. Think so. of it as you're familiar with shatter. Mm -hmm. Wax is essentially a less purge shatter, mm -hmm. right? Shatter right. is you're pulling out all, all volatiles, making it extremely stable to where so it shatters when, mm -hmm. when, it when you touch it or drop it. Wax is very similar. It's just not as stable and it gives you the ability to, to make it malleable. Yeah, that's wax. And to, so typically with a CO2 method, what would you do to make the wax? You just adjust the, the temperatures and pressures of the extraction, yeah. right? And that's it. So is there post-processing then associated with that? There's a purge. Yeah, a purge. Right. Yeah. So you would do, you'd put that into the vacuum oven, yep, turn on the vacuum, the vacuum, turn on the vacuum, no heat. Leave it overnight. Let it go. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, then, and then it would turn into a, like a waxy product. Yeah. The same thing you would do with the butane, obviously, or butane propane. Right. or you'd get your extract out you'd put it onto some parchment paper, I mm -hmm. guess, and then you would stick it into the vacuum oven. And within that, there's maybe five or six parameters that people like to deal with, right. um, both on the extraction side and on the purge side. Now, what I would say, though, is when you're making it with CO2, yeah. any residuals aren't going to be potentially harm harmful to you. To oh, yeah, right, 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 right. Exactly. Now, there are acceptable limits, parts per million limits that mm -hmm. have been you know, defined as acceptable. Yeah. But the reality is, why should we put chemicals in our body? Yeah, that's a good point. The issue is that, you know, they may be safe under, you know, like if you're consuming cheese whiz, okay, right. because it's going into the gut and it's not very bioavailable right. at that point, but it's a wholly different story when you're talking about combusting it and then inhaling Absolutely. it. So, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it's perfectly safe, but that's done in the context of not an inhaled product. It's right. done in the context of maybe a food product. Very much so. I think it's really important to make that distinction, talking about different combustibles. And I mean, in general, it's better to not have chemicals chemicals, right? I would and agree. Yeah, that's, that's a good reason why I CO2 is pretty good. The market shows that as well when, yeah. when we're talking what consumers are buying. Yeah, right? better for you stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And even in the rec market, you're seeing margins yeah. are increasing for those natural products that aren't using solvents yeah. to create these extractions. Absolutely, yeah. So we think that's a big trend, actually. And uh, we see also the sustainability aspects of that, too, are pretty good. I mean, in a GMP setting, we can kind of loop that in here since we're talking right. about this. In a GMP setting under pharma... The issue with the butane is really one of scalability. Mm -hmm. You know, you have an explosive solvent that can be safely done, but at, at a small scale. And so there's there's fire codes, international fire codes. There's the maximum amounts that you can have right. in process. And so that's just more technical stuff. You can get around that by creating a lot of infrastructure to do that. But then you have issues with solvent reuse rules yep. and solvent reuse. You, have, you can't just use your solvent again and again. I mean, in the U.S. and in the recreational market, markets, right. I would say that people are using their solvents forever. Yes. And the, the concept of having a maximum number of times you can use that solvent is really very foreign to your typical recreational right. user, right? Absolutely. And they're Absolutely. recycling into vessels essentially that they're not stainless steel, or if they are stainless steel, they're really closed on the top. 
clothes on the bottom. They really can't clean them out, right? right? And so the, the FDA has recognized that there's lots of entrained contaminants that happen from batch to batch. And therefore, they say you have to establish that there's a maximum number of times that you can use that solvent. Okay. And that's done through validation. That's done through validation right. testing. And you're looking at the impurities, identifying the impurities. Again, this is all in the context of pharmaceutical. Right. It's it, the you're consuming all this stuff on a recreational, but none of it has been characterized right. and none of the safety of it has not been established. So, you know, that's why in a pharmaceutical context, they're required to do that. Right. So then they got a maximum number of times they're they can't, they can't really clean everything. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're asking the pharmaceutical company to make sure that the method is validated in the sense that they know all the impurities and that there's not any kind of cross contamination from right. run to run. Okay. Well, the issue is then, so you kind of know your butane is going to have to be recycled every two times. Yep. What are you going to do with the butane? Well, it's going to be medical waste. Right. Hazmat and waste, right? hazmat waste that's explosive. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think there's, well, I know that there's, there's medical waste and then there's hazmat waste right. and it's probably hazmat and medical waste right. because it would have entrained stuff in it. Mm -hmm. So then that's very expensive. And then, you know, obviously they're going to flare that off. So you're taking butane now and you're making it into CO2, which is flaring off into the atmosphere. So it's not a really a sustainable method on a scalable level because right. you're just, you're using so much butane. I think you maybe could put it into a heat application where you're generating energy and maybe mm -hmm. find something cyclical. but Like a uh, secondary use for it, right? Like a secondary right. use for that um, or burn it and put combustion products into your grow. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, the plants will eat it, yeah. right? Those are some things that just to think about uh, on the wax side. So, okay, we talked about full spectrum. We did touch on that, but yeah. live resin is the next one. Live resin is, a, is an interesting thing. Can it you is. do live resin with CO2? Absolutely. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that and then some other ways ways to do live resin? Well, I think in the beginning it was considered fresh frozen, mm, right? The right. whole intent was to ensure that we can get the live expression of the plant into the extract. And the only way to do that was to freshly freeze your extracting material. Because the volatiles were leaving. Right, exactly. Again, again exactly. a extract that's not stable. Right. Right. So, so they want, they want the, uh, that flavor, that fresh, fresh flavor that comes with a, with a, fr a fresh frozen right. concept where they like say the monoterpenes or the, the volatile terpenes are right. staying in the extract mm -hmm. from a pharmaceutical perspective. That's not even stable. Right. right but from a record, it, it's is, volatizing. Right. right? Exactly. It's, it's, it's you're changing. Smelling it, it is changing. Yeah. Right. right. So, okay. So then if you want to get this uh, wonderful smelling extract into the hands of your customers, well, what do you do off on the CO2 side? See, it's just a very, very similar process. We are going to freshly freeze the input material, whether it be through uh, nitrogen or dry freezing. Right. And we are going to follow the standard process with extraction from that point. The difference is we're going to adjust the parameters to run a high flow, low pressure, meaning also very cold extraction to mitigate some of the additional plants, waxes, fats, lipids that are gonna come across in that extract. Right, okay. So you're, you're basically running at really low pressures, yep. low temperatures, and uh, is there water coming over or how do you? That's that's a, that's an issue, right? Okay. So we prefer to do the, the freeze drying method for, for live resin when using CO2 extraction because mm -hmm. if we freeze it traditionally, we are going to pull a lot of water, which is gonna require a secondary process. Right. And then you're gonna lose some of that terpene content even faster right. by removing that water or letting that water cook off. Well, that would occur too with butane, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's you're getting similar extracts with water coming out, yep. right? And then you have to remove the water from the extract itself, right? Yep. And uh, yeah, so, but they smell great. They smell fantastic and yeah. they taste great. Yeah. So that's what a live resin extract is. And, and those are in high demand. I mean, Very from much. the standpoint of recreational market and consumer market, yep. um, people like those because they like the taste, the flavor, the freshness of it. Right. Right. And it comes with that, like you said, the entourage effect that, you know, yeah. the terpenes play an intricate role in the way the cannabinoids function within the body. So right. having a full expression of terpene profile along with the cannabinoids it's a different feeling. And right. I think that's ultimately what people are after. Right. So if you get a live resin, you probably wouldn't make a brownie out of that. Right? I'd hope not. <laughs> I'd hope not. You probably, that's a direct smokable product. Okay? Absolutely. You know, uh, let's kind of talk a little bit about ideas about smoking relative to pharmaceutical. Right. A smokable pharmaceutical essentially will never get through toxicology. Never. 
It so, does not exist. You know, it, it, there is kind of an interesting aspect of this, though, because in Canada and in Europe, they're selling flour under a medical program. It's not a pharmaceutical medical. program. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's because they don't have to show toxicology uh, in a medical program because right. the rules are different because they made them different. Right. So, but people are smoking. Right. I think that in general, we'd want to try to avoid that. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, you know, there's all kinds of known cancers that come from that. For sure. That's not, it's not only with tobacco, I guess, right. but it's also with yeah. uh, any kind of combustible product. As soon as you combust something that's a plant matter, you're, you got free radicals that are happening and, you know, things like that. So 100%. One thing, you know, just take care of yourself when you think about it and, uh, you know, maybe consuming an extract in that sort of way or maybe ingesting it might be a little or sublingual even might be a mm -hmm. little bit better uh, in the recreational market. However, I mean, it is consumed that way yep. quite extensively. So Very much. I, you know, it's personal preference. Yeah, you know, I, it I, really I, is. I, I And also personal risk. You know, 100%. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. Right. And it's you. like if I always explain to people, you know, if you're looking for a medicinal value over time, orally consuming and digesting the product is ideal. That's yeah. the way to go. Right. Because otherwise you're talking about maybe some unintended consequences Absolutely. of smoking. Right. Right. And that's a, you know, COPD or lung or, you know, you, you have issues that could come up even in your whole entire, um, you know, air respiratory tract, right? So that's something that you think about, but it's not a downer. I mean, from the standpoint of uh, it still is very popular product smoking, mm -hmm. right? Very much so. <laughs> very much so. so. Yeah. And so, okay. So now we got live rosin, which is a, a play on, on, there's a vowel missing. Yes. Slight change. <laughs> <laughs> resin and rosin. Though We're going to let the expert explain the difference between those two. It's essentially rosin, rosin pressing, right? You're placing your, your material between two heated plates and plates and you're, you're pressing right. pressure to excrete the oils from the material. Initially rosin pressing was done on just flowers or cannabis buds. And then it started adjusting to bubble hash. Water hash was being made. They were cleaning out all of those uh, impurities and, and particles of the organic matter. Mm -hmm. And then pressing that that uh, ice water hash. Right. Right. And that would give you a really, really clean, really pungent, flavorful, aromatic extract. Right. Um, then they took the method of live resin, right. fresh freezing, right. right, or dry freezing even, the input material, creating bubble hash from that and then pressing that on your rosin press. Right. right. So fresh or live rosin is essentially fresh frozen rosin pressed bubble hash. Right. Okay. So that's, that's pretty good. I mean, yeah, the simplest form would be just the plant, right? Yep. Um, so you would get uh, kind of a waxy, kind I, of a waxy. Very much. And, you know, if you cure it over time, just like with, uh, you know, hydrocarbon extraction or CO2 extraction, the terpenes will start will start to separate right. um, from the cannabinoid content and right. have two separate layers. Right. Uh, and you can put rosin or live rosin into a vape pen, mm -hmm. but you have to cure it appropriately to get that separation. Right. You'd also, I mean, there'd be lots of... Well, there's be lots of fats and waxes in there Fair too, much, right? Yeah. So you, you, you know, a lot of people like to smoke that, mm -hmm. right? So, and I guess that would be like a bubble hash product that you would then, you would then um, do a, a rosin press on. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So that would probably be a more be a better smokable product. Yeah, and it's it's a cleaner product as well, visually, yeah. aesthetically, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yep. And the other side with rosin is the yield is much lower. Oh yeah, that's much, that's much a big lower. one. So doing the production wise, I mean, it's kind of like a technique for, for example, personal use. Yep. And you've seen these ones with multiple plates and everything, mm -hmm. but if you, but if you look at the recoveries of what, what do you got? So I think average we're seeing is seven to 9%. Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's tough. Yeah. There are some, what we call dumpers uh -huh. that are looking, you know, 12 to 15% recovery, but it's, it's a rarity. Yeah. And you know, that's why these products retrieve a higher price point. Yeah more work going into it. It's really, really craft. It's boutique. It's not scalable. Right. Right. But you know, people can, can do well with it if, if right. they do it efficiently. Right. So yeah, the, you're just dealing with a lot of, uh, like what you call raffinate, I guess, yep. with that, that still has a lot of the materials in it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, out of that, the product itself, even though it is kind of a low brow technique in the sense right. that it's, it's really easy to accomplish, right. right. And the equipment cost is low, so it's easy to execute mm -hmm. on and you get something and you get a waxy thing out and say, Hey, right. I made this, that that's kind of cool. So I can see the appeal of it for sure. You know, um, and I, I do know that you know, we've seen companies, you know, have two line products where they're taking that raffinate 
and they're re-extracting it with an, with a solvent like ethanol or, right. or CO2, right. and then pushing that to a distillate. Right? Okay. So they have two two streams coming from the same product. Okay. But traditional hash rosin is labor intensive. Yeah. It's manual. And right? uh, just the recovery is very low, very right? Low. So yeah, I, I get it. All right. So that's the rosin side. Now we're going to talk about the acids uh, and the good stuff. Yeah, the good stuff. CBDA, CBD, CBDVA, or uh, THCA, or or different ways of right. Of doing those acids now, uh, why don't we kind of talk about you know I, I guess that kind of hits on what decarboxylation is, but we don't probably right. don't need to talk about that. But there's basically a couple different forms of of uh, you know cannabinoids, mm-hmm. right? Uh, some of them are they come out of the plant when they're in the plant, they're acidic, right? right. Now, okay, so and a lot of people wanted to want to actually use that as either therapeutic in a therapeutic sense, right. or they want to use that for uh, consumption. Right. right? So right. let's talk about how that would be made and then kind of the pros and cons of why people don't do, you know, THCA. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, well, what's interesting is that most waxes, most shatters, most rosins are THCA when we're talking recreational market. Right. And then they convert to the Delta 9 THC upon combustion, upon combustion or vaporization. Yeah. Right. Um, what's significant about THCA specifically within the rec market is that it's, it's now becoming a target and they're making it intentionally to crystal, right? Mm-hmm. And they're, they're, you know, doing a super saturation precipitation, right. uh, allowing these crystals or diamonds to form. Mm-hmm. And you have your THCA diamonds sitting in the sauce or the terpenes, right? right? Or they're totally separating out those THC diamonds right. and washing them with pentane. So they're nice, pretty, pristine looking diamonds like right. you see at Zales or whatever jewelry store you're going to. And yeah. they're, they're essentially vaporized as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing about uh, the crystals and the larger the crystals, I mean, I saw some really large ones, so THC crystals. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah, if you do have a solvent in there, you know, the solvent is, you know, stuck inside of the right. the crystal matrix and mm-hmm. it's very difficult to get that out. Very much Even so. under 72, 90 hours in a vacuum. Right. It's very, very difficult to, to really get those out. So one that's one thing to think about when you're talking about THCA. Um, yeah, diamonds and sauce, right? Right. Ran the market for a while. Yeah. That was, that was the go-to product. Yeah, it really was. It really was. You had mentioned typically people, when they consume it, it changes from THCA to THC neutral or THC Delta Mm nine upon combustion. And that's really what we call decarboxylation. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, in order to get it into your body, it's not very bioavailable if it's in the acid form. Right. Right. Exactly. And the the exception is distillate is Delta nine. Typically, so right. you buy a vape cartridge that's already been converted and the acid molecule exactly. has changed, right? So the other thing would be, you know, the receptors, there's really a lot of questions as to what receptors, the THCA, if it does get into your bloodstream at all, mm-hmm. what it's actually doing, right? right? It's it's not a psychoactive uh, drug, is it, or is it metabolized? And have you tried just THCA? I have, mm-hmm. but not oral consumption digestion. Yeah. It's been vaporized. Okay. So I've never ex- experimented with... Yeah, I'm sure it'll probably. metabolize and then I, I don't know what those metabolites will do, but it's going to be, you know, there's going to be some metabolites and I don't know if it's psychoactive, but. Well, I think that's the other benefit of the pharmacide is yeah. that now there's going to be money for the research so they right. can actually see and follow and track what these things are doing inside the body long term. Right, right. Yeah. So that's an exciting area. And uh, certainly some people are looking to do, you know, THCA, CBDA, right. uh, which are basically the acidic forms of these cannabinoids that are natural in the plant, but are typically decarboxylated so that they become bioavailable in humans right. you know, when they're consumed, whether that's done through combustion or that's done through uh, in the laboratory mm. via distillate or something right. like that. So, well, that kind of gets us to our final, final one, which is the distillate. Yep. I yep. jumped the gun a little bit, but no, I wanted no. to get the explanation. That's all good. Yeah, yeah. That's all good. So um, why don't you take us through the process to create a good distillate? It's a long process. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's labor intensive. Uh-huh. So you're, you're depending on the method, right? You're either going to decarboxylate your input material before you extract or after you extract once it's in oil form. Mm-hmm. Um, for the process we prefer to use when we're going to distillate, we like to decarb prior to so we can collect the terpenes and use them later on if need be or wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, So we'll decarboxylate prior, extract with our crude extraction CO2 uh, system, and then depending on what method you're using, you're either going to use traditional solvent-based winterization to move into distillation, 
or you're going to use our process, which is the continuous flow automated system mm-hmm. where you are able to negate all that winterization and go straight into distillate. Right. Okay. So distillate is, uh, when we talk about distillate, there's a lot of, well, there's several different ways. I mean, there's a whole idea of what, short path, there's white film, yep. and all those are absolutely legitimate, right? I mean, yep. you can short path a lot of people or like short path experts, right? Yeah. Um, it's and, just not, there's no continuity in product with short path. Yeah. The way you run a short path is going to be different than the way I run the short path. And if yeah. you're trying to make a product that's, that's got continuity, right. You're never going to be able to hit those numbers right. as you're switching operators. I walked into a laboratory one time with, uh, no less than 20 short paths going on oh. at the same time. And the, the output was very, you know, it was very hard to hit like a 90%. Right. Okay. And this is with a pretty good input material. Um, the other thing is it was pretty inconsistent. I mean, Absolutely. it would be one, one would have, you know, 67, the other would be, you know, 87, 75, it's just all over the place. Yep. So they ended up having to blend to a, a standard, but then to deliver that again and again would be, would be difficult. Very difficult. The other thing is, uh, what they always called stability, which is basically viscosity, mm-hmm. right? So if you have a short path, and by the way, I should probably back up and say what that is, but. Um, I'll finish my thought, right. uh, stability where, you know, where you take that jar full of the distillate and you turn it upside down and does it run? Right. Right. Okay. So some of them, some of them would run and some of them wouldn't. Mm-hmm. So that was, that was the issue. So, uh, what we're talking about here is just basically just a piece of glassware, some bulb with a heating mantle on it and a condenser. Um, and you know, typically people would use these, um, and we have many podcasts on, yeah. on these things. So you guys can go ahead and take a look. A uh, different way to do it would be the white film, obviously. Which the preferred is, way, I yeah, think, yeah. Well, it's definitely a more it's reproducible. preferred way. Yeah, sure. it's more reproducible, probably easier to handle. Watch so. Gonna, yeah. So, um, yeah, why do you like one over the other? Well, sure They, they kind of produce different things. And, you know, yeah, but, different, yeah. but similar as well, right? So with short path, you're, you're boiling a mass in a bowl. Yeah. And you're making this vapor climb, and then you got to condense it on the condenser. Add a lot of heat. Yeah, and it takes a lot of heat, a lot of power to get that going, right? Yeah. And you like you, you get to the end does it you know start to cook a little bit right. it gets really dark you're always leaving stuff behind mm-hmm. um, and then you're adding oxygen into the flow because mm-hmm. you're removing glassware and you're swapping out you know flasks with a with a wiped film you're putting your input material in you're getting a finished product that's in a contained environment so there's no oxidation possible mm-hmm. and it's stable mm-hmm. much more stable and mm-hmm. because you were we're not boiling a mass and right. we're boiling a very very thin film right the molecules separate a lot easier because yeah. it's a faster evaporation yeah so yeah i would say the way i look at it is a one of uh, you know time to de- degrade right mm-hmm. so you have a bowl it's heated up. Everything's degrading in there. And you yep. can kind of actually, uh, it, in the end, you can kind of smell that in your extracts. Yeah. It, it may have different smell. Right. Sometimes it has an off odor, yeah. but not all the time, right? right. So that's a, just that's probably just because things are um, maybe degrading in there For sure. or something like that. Making Whereas, it plastic, cannabis plastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but polymerizing yeah. in there. Uh, yeah, but the the white film, which is really nice because the residence time that it experiences the heat is is very uniform, mm-hmm. right? And so it's a thin film, and like you and said, minimal. as long as the, and, and minimal, minimal, yeah, minimal home on heat. So, well, that's what a distillate is. So you you would typically get a residue, and then the the product, right? right. And and that product would for CBD typically you'd get you know anywhere from eighty five to ninety five percent, right? And in, and the CBD if it was decarboxylated, which you would have to have a decarboxylated, correct? which we'll get to in just yep. a second, but th- that would be something along the lines of, uh, yeah, like, you know, 85 to 90%, typically 90%, it would be crystallized out mm-hmm. after, after it cooled down, right? right? It would look really good and then it would crystallize yep. out, right? And it's one hard solid mass. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, the THC, you might actually get a little bit better, say 90 to, you know, 95, 90. 96, yep. you know, percent. Um, just, to, just seems to distill a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe that's just method. I'm not sure, but yeah, I think, uh, it just, in my opinion, it, it distills better because the, the boiling point gap is a little, is a little larger, mm-hmm. right? So you're able to pull more. Makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's, uh, that's distillate. Now we, we kind of touched on decarboxylation and the need to decarboxylate before you, uh, distill, right? Right. And that's just simply because um, 
you know, the acids have a really high boiling point compared to the neutrals, right? right. So you need to take, remove that acidic form off of the molecule in order for it to be volatile within right. the range that you would like to be volatile, yeah. right? So just basically lowering the temperature uh, that the whole extract will experience, right. right? So that's the main reason why you would you decarboxylate. The other reason is I know on the short path side, if you don't decarboxylate and you put, you know, all of your acidic, you know, oils on the top, it, it basically CO2 is a yes. byproduct and mm -hmm. then it starts to pop and bubble and oh, yeah. pop, 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 I've pop. broken many a Vigoro. <laughs> okay. By not being fully decarbed. I see. Absolutely. There we go. And in the case of uh, like a stainless steel still, like a molecular still, mm. Um, you're just getting lots of popping, and so you get a lot of the oil that comes from the wall over to the the cold finger in the right. center. So um, that would be so just less. It's diluting it essentially. Right. right. So. Now I have in the past that we we are able to make or allow the acid forms to to make it through the distillation. Yeah. Right. And yeah. collect with the distillate, but it's never 100. percent Right. right. You're never going to be able to make a pure acid form distillate through this method. There right. are other ways to do it. But using this process, it's, it's not the best way to go. Right. Okay, there we have it, folks. I mean, we have talked about um, cannabis extracts. We've talked about wax. We've talked about full spectrum. Yep. We've got some rosin in there, live, live resin, resin, rosin, and uh, distillate. So that's kind of the overview. Uh, kind of talked to also GMP aspects of extracts a little bit. We touched on those, touched on some of the solvent, ac uh, solvent uh, aspects. Right. We talked a little bit about how to make each of those extracts. So hopefully this was helpful for you guys. Right we just barely touched the surface on how to make these extracts and what these extracts really contain. If you have any questions, by all means, drop a comment and we'll get back to you. Uh, until next time, we'll, we'll catch you later and uh, happy extracting. See ya.